Well, today the title of my message is How to Recover from Your Failure. Now, let me clarify what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about like if you tried to run a marathon and you only made it 24 miles and you had to quit. That's not the kind of failure we're talking about. We're not talking about if you started a business and you had to close it down. That's not what we're talking about either. What we're talking about is something that we're all familiar with. We have all sinned. Now, I realize that um, some people don't like to hear that, but it's the truth. The fact is, you're not perfect, and neither am I. The truth of the matter is, we all blow it from time to time. And, and that's the truth, right? We all blow it. Even pastors. Uh, Kim and I have been in full-time ministry for 35 years now. In May, it'll be 36 years. And uh, we, in four years of Bible college, we also were in ministry. So if you count that, it's been 39 years and in May will be 40 years. But would it be surprising to you to know that there have been many, many times that I've blown it? I remember when Kim and I were first married, um, I was spending a lot of time at the church and uh, so was she, but we were just married and so we had not been uh, together very long. And I remember her one day, she was kind of sad and I was like, what's wrong? And she's like, well, it seems like you love the church more than you love me. Now, rather than being a wise, mature husband that realized his wife simply needed a hug, that she needed some support, that she needed some love, I, in my righteous indignation, in my uh, zeal for the Lord. You know what I said to Kim? I said, you just don't love Jesus very much, do you? Not my finest moment. I'm going to admit it. Not my finest moment. And there have been many times in our marriage that I've blown it in uh, things like that. Now, if you're one of those people that says, uh, well, my shortcoming, my weakness is that I care too much. I want to give permission to the person sitting next to you to punch you in the ear, all right? Because we all do more than we care too much. The fact is, we all, from time to time, we will blow it. And we just have to be honest about that. Even the best Christian, even the person that loves God the most, because we are sinners, because we're born that way, even though we're redeemed, even though we've been forgiven, even though God has saved us, listen, we all blow it from time to time. Now, hopefully, the longer you're a Christian, the less times you do that. Uh, but I want to talk to you today about what to do when that happens. How do you recover from it? How do you get back on track? And, and by the way, let me say this. For some, you blow it bigger than others. And we have to admit, there are times in our life that uh, we blow it a little, a little bit, and then there are times that we blow it a lot. And so what I want to talk to you about is how to navigate that biblically, what does God say about our relationship with him uh, when that happens. So I'm going to tell you the story about Achan. Now we've been looking at the book of Joshua, and this is about uh, the Israelites' conquest of the promised land. For those of you that don't know that much about the Bible, the Israelites uh, had been enslaved in Egypt uh, for a very long time. God freed them, and he promised them a land of their own. It's a picture of salvation. There's a lot of spiritual implication in that, but that's why it's called the promised land, because God promised that land to them. Isn't that cool? It makes sense, right? And so uh, they are getting ready to conquer the land. And they're going city by city because um, they can't conquer the whole country at once because it wasn't like in our day. We live in the United States of America, and uh, it would be like city states. And so rather than conquering an entire nation, they would go city by city. All right, so they just conquered Jericho. We talked about that last week. Uh, odd way of doing it. They marched around the city uh, for six days, one time. On the seventh day, they did it seven times. They blew trumpets, ram horn, ram's horns. The walls fell down, and that's how they conquered the city. Very 
odd and very unusual. Well, they're feeling pretty good. I mean, I would be too after a big victory like that. And so they come to the next city they're coming to is a tiny village. It's not a giant city with walls. It's a tiny village, and it's called Aya. It's spelled A-I, and for years I pronounced it I or A-I, uh, but actually the way you pronounce it is Aya, Aya, Aya. Anybody feel like doing karate chops with that? All right. Uh, the fact is, um, this city was nothing more than a village, a few thousand people. And so um, the, they, they went to attack the city and to conquer it, and these few thousand men just kicked the Israelites' rear end. I mean, big time. They, they killed a lot of them. It was a big defeat. It was totally embarrassing. And so they got back, and um, Jer- uh, Joshua was like, God, what's wrong? I'm upset. And God says, well, somebody did something that they should not do. I told you that all of the plunder of when you conquered the city of Jericho was to be dedicated to me. They weren't to touch any of it. And somebody has taken something that they should not have taken. They took what was dedicated to God, which is always a bad idea. Well, the man that did it, his name was Achan. And he took really three things. He took some expensive clothes. He took some gold and some silver. Uh, The gold and the silver in our economy today will be worth somewhere around $100,000. So it was not an insignificant thing that he took. And he took it and he hid it in his tent. And so uh, the story goes that uh, 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 Joshua prayed. God revealed that somebody had sinned, somebody had blown it. And uh, so they go through and they find out what had happened. And God's judgment came on Achan and his family because of his sin. By the way, God does not hold the children responsible for the sins of their fathers. But the sins of the fathers always affect the children. That's why it's so important that you get your kids involved here at Avalon Church. That's why it's so important that your middle school and high schoolers get involved here at Avalon Church. Why? Because you're not perfect, you're going to blow it, but the good news is that when you get your kids worshiping God together, you got a whole lot better chance of them surviving. A whole lot better chance of them coming out like they should. They're not going to be perfect because you're not perfect. Nobody is. And so anyway, uh, Achan is a story of redemption. You say, how is that? Because at the end, when uh, after Achan had gone through what he went through, the Israelites went back and they conquered the city of Aya and they won a great victory. So I don't have time to read the entire, there's two chapters that cover this story. I wanted to tell you the story, and I'm going to read some selected verses, and then we're going to talk about three things that you and I need to do when we recognize failure in our life, all right? Three things that we need to do. Uh, Let me read to you a couple of uh, of verses from Joshua 7, 1, but Israel violated the instructions about the things set apart for the Lord, and a man named Achan had stolen some of these dedicated things, so the Lord was very angry with the Israelites. By the way, you may wonder when you read the Old Testament about a lot of things. Last week, we talked about what it meant uh, to be devoted to destruction. Did God really tell them to kill babies? Well, we talked about how the Lord drove them out and hyperbole and all that kind of stuff. Uh, And so, You may wonder why God would be so angry at something that's seemingly not worth or not worthy of being put to death. I mean, look, let's be honest. If you steal something, uh, yeah, you'll have to go through the justice system. But even if you stole something that's worth $100,000, it's not a death penalty. We don't put people to death in this country because of that, okay? So you might wonder, why was God so very, very angry? And here's the reason. Because Achan violated the covenant. Now, you may wonder what I mean by that. But when you look in the Bible, 
one of the most important covenants in Scripture is what is called the Abrahamic covenant. God's covenant with Abraham. What did God promise Abraham? That all of the world would have a Messiah, a Savior that would come through his lineage and that there would be opportunity for everyone to be saved. You say, well, what do you mean? Why was God upset? Because he's always upset with those that try to violate the way of salvation. Let me tell you, there are some people that are very moral people that violate the covenant. You say, what do you mean? Well, there are some people that are very good and they believe that the way that you get right with God, the way you go to heaven when you die, is very simple. Keep the Ten Commandments. And they're moral people. My grandmother was one of those moral people. For many, many years, we talked to her about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And she could just never see that she truly needed a Savior. When she was 70 years old, she gave her heart and life to Jesus Christ. Now, there are many people that violate the covenant today. In other words, they believe that there's another way of salvation than through Jesus Christ. They believe that you can be a member of a church and go to heaven, and that's how you get there, or be a good person, or keep the Ten Commandments. God is very, very, very strong when it comes to his covenant for salvation. Why? Because he loves us, because he wants us to be saved. He wants us to be in right relationship with the Father, and he gets very upset when anybody messes with that. And so what Achan did was a violation of the covenant that God had made with Israel. And uh, to make it where we understand it, it was simply that he was violating that which dealt with salvation. And so there are people, I'm sure, that have been to Avalon Church that maybe they're unaware of it, but they violate this covenant. And God is very serious about your salvation. God is very serious about wanting you to become a part of his family. And he's not okay with you missing the way of salvation. And so that's why God would be that upset. Well, let's read on uh, a few other verses. Uh, chapter 7, verses 10 and 11. But the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why are you lying on your face like this? This was after their defeat. Israel has sinned and broken my covenant. There's that word. They have stolen some of the things that I commanded must be set apart for me. And they have not only stolen them, but have lied about it and hidden the things among their own belongings. And then we'll skip down to verse number 20. And Achan replied, it is true, I've sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. Among the plunder, I saw a beautiful robe from Babylon, 200 silver coins and a bar of gold weighing more than a pound. I wanted them so much that I took them. It's important for you to let that sentence be on your radar. When we do not guard ourselves, our desires can overcome us. Our temptations can overcome us. I wanted them so much that I took them. They are hidden in the ground beneath my tent with a silver buried deeper than the rest. Chapter 8, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid or discouraged. Take all your fighting men and attack Aya, for I have given you the king of Aya, his people, his town, and his land. So you see the progression. They had finished the battle of Jericho. They lost that first fight. They came back and repented. They worshiped God they went back and God gave them a victory. And then I want you to see verse, eight, uh, verse 30 of chapter 8. And then Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel. So there's this progression here that I want to show you that informs us, and we can take some principles from this, on how we overcome the sins and the failures in our life. And here's the first thing you've got to do. You must recognize your temptation. Now, did you know that there are some things that don't tempt me at all? I'm just simply not tempted by them. Uh, I know some people are, but I'm not. But yet, there are other things that I'm greatly tempted by. And you're the same way. There are some things that 
probably don't tempt you at all. They don't bother you at all. Uh, But yet there are other things that are great temptation to you. We must learn to recognize our own temptation. In the New Testament, it talks about the sins that so easily beset us. You're going to have what we would refer to as a besetting sin. You, You may be more tempted to lie than some people. You may be more tempted to take something that's not yours or to cheat or to be dishonest than some people. There may be some lustful things in your life that you're more tempted by than others. There are are many people that are tempted by their temper. You've got to recognize your temptation. And I want to show you a couple things you need to do. Number one, you must realize that you're more vulnerable, vulnerable after a great victory. Now, the Israelites had just won a great victory at Jericho, and then... They were vulnerable to sin. I can't tell you the number of times after a great victory that I have gone into a, brief, although maybe it was brief, a depression. I don't know why that is, to be honest with you. Often after a big weekend, people being saved, people being baptized, I live for that, seeing people's lives change. The next day, I'm sorely tempted about things. There's a running joke among pastors. Pastors never want to quit except for every Monday. And the fact is, often after a great victory, we are vulnerable to temptation. So you must recognize that. There are going to be great events in your life that are a high, sometimes a spiritual high, sometimes an emotional high, and you must be aware that you're going to be vulnerable after a great victory. And then... Just like Achan, uh, we are vulnerable when we hide and isolate. God is intended for us to connect with other believers. And when you hide and isolate, guess what happens? You become more vulnerable than ever to your sin. One of the things that I've discovered over my years of being a pastor is there are particular sins that carry greater shame, not necessarily that they're greater sin than other things, but there just seems to be something embarrassing about it. And and I've dealt with many men, and and women as well, uh, that become addicted to pornography. And it's like that's the one thing that for many people, they cannot be honest about. It's like when They do that, they feel more isolated, they cover up more than almost any other thing. And you know what happens? The more you isolate, the more you uh, separate, the more vulnerable you become. And it becomes a cycle that you cannot get out. I've discovered that for many men, uh, particularly, that maybe they deal with this, they just are terrified to talk to their wife about it. And sometimes for good reason. Sometimes the wife can be extremely judgmental. And once again, I'm not suggesting that your husband should look at porn. But I'm just saying that oftentimes our response shuts down openness. You know what God wants us to do? Not to isolate. Not to separate. But to connect. You must be aware that you are going to be very vulnerable when you hide and separate, and you hide and isolate. And then number three, when you're going to deal with temptation, you must learn to rest in God's grace. You see, because it is the grace of God that frees us. Now, let me kind of explain that to you if I can. Uh, In the New Testament, you know there's an Old Testament written before Jesus, a New Testament written after Jesus uh, came to the earth, and um, there are 27 books of the New Testament. Now, most of those, you got the four Gospels and the book of Acts, but the rest of those are actual letters. They're letters written to churches. And uh, of the 27 books in the New Testament, 22 of those books are letters. And of those 22 letters, get this, 17, 17 of those New Testament books, those letters to the churches, began with these words, grace to you. Grace 
to you, or grace and peace to you. 17 of those 22 letters contain that in the introduction. Isn't that amazing? God wants you to know that he wants to give his grace to you. He wants us to live in the power of his grace. Now, the interesting thing about that, uh, in, in fact, the apostle Peter, uh, he was one of the ones that wrote this, but he took it up a notch in 2 Peter. He said, grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now, what is God saying? Because the introduction is also inspired scripture. The introduction is also from God. I believe that God is showing us that his grace is incredibly important, even when we fail, even when we sin. And I would say, especially when we sin. Now, what is God's grace? It is his unearned, unmerited, and undeserved kindness and favor, right? So God gives us his grace freely, not because we deserve it, not because he gives us a gold star for the good things we did during the week, but it's free because of what Jesus did. Now, I want you to listen to what the apostle Paul wrote about grace. Paul was suffering. By the way, whenever we suffer, when we go through difficult times, we often question the grace of God, don't we? Paul was doing that. We're not sure exactly what this difficulty he was going through. It could have been physical. could have been a person. We don't know. Uh, could have been somebody that was just hounding him. Um, but I want you to read with me what he wrote about this. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, God speaking to Paul, he said, my grace is sufficient for you. Now let that sink in. No matter what the circumstance, no matter what the problem, no matter what the temptation, no matter what the pain, God's grace is sufficient for you. For, notice what he said, this is important, my power is made perfect in weakness. Isn't that incredible? God's power is greatly demonstrated even though you are weak when you turn to him. He said, well, my weakness is that I just can't control my temper. Turn that to God. Admit that you have that weakness and let God's grace work in your life. You'll be amazed at what happens. You see, he said, my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, this is Paul talking, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest on me. Now, there's a couple things that we can mine out of that verse. Grace helps you endure. You got a temptation, you got a sin, you got a problem. You got a test you're going through. God's grace will help you endure. It'll help you survive. Uh, Number two, uh, God's grace gives you power. Now, those things that you think are your weaknesses can actually become the strengths that God uses in your life. That's what's amazing about the grace of God. I've seen so many people that had a a weakness, a, a background, a a problem, a failure, and they let God turn that weakness, that failure, into a ministry. Seen it happen many, many times. My wife and I met a man in Hawaii. We were over there on a ministry trip. It's a difficult job, but somebody's got to do it. Hallelujah, praise God. Y'all can send me back again sometime, anytime they need ministering to over there in Hawaii. But we were there and we went to this church and one of the staff pastors of this church was a former uh, lifetime, he had been given a a uh, a life sentence without the possibility of parole. There was no way he was ever, he had murdered a man as a young man. He's gonna spend the rest of his life in prison. Well, make a long story short, People began to, he got saved. He truly didn't just have a jailhouse conversion, but he really began to minister to the men in that jail and in that prison, and God began to use him, and it got to the ears of this pastor. Well, to make a long story short, they began to intervene, and over a process of time, they commuted this man's sentence, and he is a pastor on staff at this church, 
And guess what ministry he has? He has a ministry to the prisoners and to the people in jail. Isn't that beautiful? And here's the point. I don't know what your background is. Well, I know some of you, but um, maybe there's something that you think is a weakness that God can use to minister to other people. And it doesn't matter what it is. God lets his grace give you power. Power. And then notice what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No test or temptation that comes your way is beyond the course of what others have had to face. Do you know that it's biblical for you to get support? Not on people that like, you know, are from people that are like, oh yeah, you just keep on sinning. You keep on leaving him, honey. Uh, You deserve something better. We're going to have some fun anyway. I'm not talking about that. But God says that others have faced temptation just like you have. You're not isolated. You're not alone. That's one of the beauties of church. You can come in here. That's why we say that Avalon Church is the perfect place for imperfect people. Why? Because we don't want anybody to pretend here. We don't want anybody to act like they've never sinned. We don't want anybody to act like you're perfect because you're not. Jesus is, but you're not. But I'm so glad that he says, there are other people that can help you face this. He says, all you need to remember is that God will never let you down. God will never let you down. God will never let you down. He'll never let you be pushed past your limit. Sometimes we think he does, but he doesn't. And he'll always be there to help you come through it. Always. And then the last thing about grace is it helps you resist. It'll help you endure. It'll give you power. And it'll help you resist the sin that tempts you. Now, that's not a license to sin by any stretch of the imagination. But God says he will help you through it. Recognize your temptation. That's the problem that Achan had. He didn't recognize and he became secretive. He hid. He wanted to isolate himself. And whenever you do that, you're very vulnerable. Here's the second thing. You need to repent of your sin. Repent. Now, I know that if you grew up in church uh, like I did after my dad got saved and we started going to church when I was a kid, um, you know, there's sometimes a negative connotation with the word repent. Because when I always heard the word repent, it was the picture of a bony-fingered preacher that spit all over the first two rows, and he said, repent! And that was kind of that judgmental, accusing kind of way of uh, preaching, and what he meant by repent was you need to turn from the crappy things you're doing. And did you know that that's not what the word repent means at all? It's not even close. Repent does mean to turn around, but you know what repent, the word repent means? It means to change your thinking. It means to agree with God. That's why it says in Romans chapter 12, Uh, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Repentance is agreeing with God. Repentance is changing your thinking. And until you change your thinking, or you better yet, you allow God to change your thinking, you're never going to change your behavior long term. You can change it for a minute, but repent means to agree with God about things. And repentance... I believe, and the word repent, these are two of the greatest words in the Christian vocabulary. They are two of the greatest words of blessing in our life. God's not waiting to hit you over the head with a holy bat. He's not the uh, evil kid in the sky that, you know, burns the wings off of a fly, uh, you know, with with a magnifying glass. A lot of people think that's what God does with you. It's like whatever he can do to make your life miserable, that's what he's going to do. That's not who God is. You know what God is, though? He wants you to change the way you think and agree with him. And when I repent, it does require me to admit my sin, 
to admit that my sin is against God. Listen to what King David wrote. And this, he wrote this after he sinned with Bathsheba, by the way. Uh, Psalm 51, verses 1 through 4. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And here's the key. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me and against you and you only have I sinned. Against you and you only have I sinned. Here's the thing about repentance. When you begin to understand what God wants you to agree with him on, you're gonna agree that there's a better way to live. You're gonna agree that there's a blessed way to live, that living God's way is so far superior to the way that you have been living. God will change your life. And he doesn't just change it, he changes it for the good. He changes it for so much better. Well, I've got to recognize my temptation, repent of my sin, and then here's the third thing. I've got to receive God's restoration. The Israelites had to receive restoration from God, and there are some, no doubt, even at our church, that you've blown it, and you're like, I can never serve God again, or I can never be like it was before. Oh, I'm just going to quit going to that church because, you know, I've blown it. If they find out what I did, they're not going to want me to come there anymore, and you just beat yourself up, and you live, instead of in grace, you live in regret. Nothing wrong with regretting your sins. We should regret our sins. But then you give it to God and you let it go. That's what grace does. You see, when I turn it over to God, I recognize that it's not my goodness, but it's his that saves me. And his grace is abundant. His grace is amazing. When I give it to him, um, here's the final thing. You gotta receive God's restoration. Restoration. First Peter 5.10, and after you have suffered a little while, by the way, the sufferings of this world are just a short moment compared to eternity. Aren't you glad for that? Just a little while. No matter what you're going through, no matter what the test is, no matter what the temptation is, it's just a little while. It's short. He says, and after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, there's that word again, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus. Isn't that good news? That eternal glory, that eternal grace, you're gonna live in his grace forever. Thank God for that. But I want you to notice what he does. He says, after you've gone through a test for a minute, after you've faced the temptation, the hardship, he said he will himself. He's not delegating it to somebody else. He's not saying, hey, Gabriel, go down here and do that for uh, them on earth. He said God himself will do this for you. He will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Isn't that beautiful? That's what God will do even when you have failed, when you admit it to him. Now, what does that mean? He will restore you. He authorizes comebacks. I'm so glad for that. You may have blown it in the past. You may have fallen short in the past. You may be embarrassed about the past, but thank God he is a God that restores. Oh, thank God for that. He himself will do it if you'll let him. It's the God of grace. If you'll let him, if you'll let him. And then he says he will use you. The word confirm, I love this word. Listen to what it means in the Greek language. It means to cause someone to be more able despite their weakness. Now, I know you didn't get that, okay? Because otherwise, we'd have some people running laps in here, okay? Let, let, let me read it again. And I want you to really think. Uh, when it says that he will confirm you, okay, here's what the word means. He will cause you 
to be more able despite your weaknesses. Now, what you thought was the problem, God can say, I'll just use that. What you thought was embarrassing when you give it to God and let it be covered by his grace, he's like, oh yeah, I'm going to use that. Oh, you murdered somebody when you were young and then you got saved. I want you to know that my blood covers all of your sin no matter what. I'm going to use you. Maybe you're embarrassed by what you went through. Maybe there's been pain in your past that you thought was unnecessary. But you know what God says? I'll use it. In spite of your weakness, I'm going to use it. I'm going to make you more able because of the weakness. Do you know that's the way we work as people? You ever met a person that pretended they have everything together? And they acted like, they ain't never sinned before. And they acted like, and forgive me for my crudeness, that their poop don't stink. You know what I'm saying? I used to say that as a kid. You ever met people like that? They're never wrong about anything. I mean, the solution to all the problems of the world is if everybody just does what they say. They're never wrong. They've never done anything that they need forgiveness for. They're just, they're just perfect. Now, let me ask you a question. If you know somebody like that, and be honest, you're in church. Do you like that person? No. We don't, you know, in fact, we can't stand people like that. Uh, When I was a kid, uh, we used to say that if you didn't like somebody, uh, you was like, I wouldn't give that guy air and a jug. And, And look, You and I may not like people like that because it's human nature to reject the holier than thou, the person that acts like they're perfect. But did you know that when you admit your weakness, God says, I'm gonna use you even more. The thing that you think might be a problem, God says, no, 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 that's not the problem. I'll use that. Oh yeah, I realize that you're not perfect and when you start telling people about what Jesus has done in your life and you let them know that you're not perfect and yeah, you blow it and yeah, you sin, that doesn't turn them off. You know what that does? That makes their ears perk up because they're like, well, that person's being honest. That person's kind of like me. I do things that I shouldn't do. I've failed in the past. I've got sin. I don't want anybody to know about it. But maybe, maybe, I'll listen to what they have to say about Jesus. You see, God will use, he'll confirm you. He'll use you more than if you didn't have any weakness. He will strengthen you. That doesn't have to be explained very much. He'll give you strength. He will put you on a firm foundation. He says he'll establish you. Wouldn't it be good if your life was on a firm foundation? Oh, there are going to be winds, and there are going to be storms, and there's going to be rain, and there are going to be hurricanes, and there's going to be storms at sea, but when your life is on a firm foundation, you don't have to worry. All the winds can come, and they can go, and they can blow, but you're not worried. You know why? You're on a firm foundation. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a little bit more People that have firm foundations, they're not going to be blown off course by what it says on the news. They're not going to be blown off course by uh, some silly argument. They're not going to be blown off course by something that offends so many people. We live in a culture that gets offended so easily. It blows my mind. Just, I mean, literally offended by everything. But you're not going to be blown off course. You know why? God has set you on a firm foundation. I want you to see what they did after their victory. Joshua 8, 35. Every word of every command that Moses had ever given was read to the entire assembly of Israel, including the women and children and the foreigners who lived among them. You know what they did that really solidified this victory, this comeback in their life? After their victory, they worshiped. They worshiped God. 
they said that they read scripture. And can I tell you this? You're dealing with temptation, you're dealing with problems, dealing with failures. You know what the most important thing you can do is? Read the Bible and pray. Oftentimes when we sin, we're like, we want to pretend like God doesn't want to hear from us. Well, God must not like me very much because, man, I blew it. And I knew that I shouldn't have done that, but I did it anyway. And you know what? I'm just not, I'm just not going to go around because I, I don't want to talk to him. He, he's upset with me. That's the time you should talk to him. That's the time you should read the Bible. That's what they did. Uh, it strengthened them. And then final thing, we're done. That verse we just read, I, I want to break it down. It says, they read it to the entire assembly. You know what the assembly represents in the Old Testament? The church. You know what I glean from that? You ought to go to church. You ought to go to church. Not just a building. It's a people being connected. God wants you to be connected. Why? Because it'll strengthen you. It'll help you stay on course. Then it says that the women... Now, it's interesting that it said this because he went out of the way in a culture that didn't really champion women's rights very much. And yet, he pointed this out. And you know why I believe he did this? To show us the importance of family. Not that women just represent the family, but boy, I gotta be honest, my wife keeps our family together. Now, I do a little bit, but the fact is, most women, most moms, they are the glue that holds the family together. And listen, you know what it means? You need to bring your family to church. You need to go to church, bring your family. You say, well, I'm going to let my kids, they're, they're getting up around 10, 11 years old. I'm going to let my kids make their own decision. Do not be a fool. And I don't mean to be offensive but the fact is, you would not let a 10-year-old child make a decision about whether or not to go to school. You would not let a 10-year-old child make a decision about moving out and living on their own. Why? Because they're too immature. They're too young. And neither should you let your children make that decision. Now, hopefully, you do get them where they do make their own decisions as they get older. But don't be foolish enough to think, well, if I just let, leave them to their own devices, they'll decide whether or not they want to love God. Man, you wouldn't do that with anything else in their life. I mean, as a 10-year-old boy, are you kidding me? 10-year-old boys, man, they don't have enough sense uh, to get out of the rain. You know, when I was 10 years old, if my parents had left it up to me, it would have been nothing but, uh, you know, candy and, and uh, you know, lizards and weird stuff in the house, you know? I'd blow stuff up. I'd burn the house down. So bring the family. And then it says, the children, I believe that we need to emphasize our children in the next generation here at this church. Avalon Kids is extremely important. It is extremely important for you to bring your middle and high schoolers to Avalon Youth. Why? Because if you're going to preserve the next generation, you got to bring them. You got to bring them. And then the last thing is this. He said, the foreigners that are among you, what does that mean? Well, I believe it means that we've got to evangelize We've got to invite people who are not here yet. We've got to invite because inviting is evangelism. We've got to make sure that we are doing missions around the world. Why? Because God wants the whole world to know. Not just us, but the whole world to know. And I hope that when you fail, you'll follow what they did. You'll recognize what tempts you. Do something about it. Man, you will repent, turn to God, change your thinking, and you'll just receive the grace of God in your life. And God will restore you, and he'll set you on a firm foundation. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Avalon Church YouTube channel. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. 
If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision of Avalon Church, you can do so by clicking the Give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time.